Stanford University. Welcome. Welcome to Stanford's Contemplation by Design program, Compassion, Gratitude, All, Self-Transcendent Emotions for Collective and Planetary Well-Being. I am Dr. Tia Rich, Director and Founder of Stanford's Contemplation by Design program in the Stanford School of Medicine. Our speaker is Professor Dacker Keltner, a professor at UC Berkeley and faculty director and founder of the Greater Good Science Center, also at UC Berkeley. Dacker's research focuses on the biological and evolutionary origins of compassion, awe, love, beauty, and humility, as well as power, social class, and inequality. Dacker is the author of several hundred scientific articles several books, including Born to be Good, The Science of a Meaningful Life, The Compassionate Instinct, and The Power Paradox, How We Gain and Lose Influence. And he has written for popular outlets like the New York Times. Dacker has won many research, teaching, and service awards and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has consulted for Apple, Pinterest, Google, the Sierra Club, and was a scientific consultant for Pixar's Inside Out, and for the Center for Constitutional Rights in its work to outlaw solitary confinement. We wholeheartedly welcome Dacker. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to your talk. Uh, thank you so much. And it's so wonderful to be with all of you um, uh, on our uh, our webinar here. Um, what an honor to be with you and what an what a, uh, exhilarating moment to think about contemplative design in medicine. I think it's a future of medicine uh, and very timely uh, as we slowly and, and fitfully come out of COVID. And what an honor to be part of this today. I love the concept of planetary well-being that Dr. Yuria Sleedwin introduced to me um, from the United Nations. I know she's been part of this conference that our well-being is linked up very clearly through the emotions I'm going to talk about today, compassion, gratitude, and all with the well-being of others. But then more broadly, um, those practices and those forms of contemplation are deeply intertwined, as you will see, through emotions um, to the, the status and the health of the eco ecological systems around us. So uh, for those of you who are interested in more, go to greatergood.berkeley.edu. That's the Greater Good Science Center's main website. We have education programs, contemplative practices, a magazine read by about a million people. Um, and then email me if you like, and I'm happy to uh, hear what you guys are thinking about. So um, today I'd really like to tell you three stories about, um, about three critical emotions in our uh, evolutionary history. And that I think really bear importantly upon the history of our species going forward. Uh, compassion, gratitude, and awe. Um, in his wonderful book, Humanity, Jonathan Glover, this remarkable historian, writes about something that he calls sympathy breakthroughs, which is in the heat of combat, when adversaries are facing each other uh, and their lives are on the line, um, thank you, <laughs> um, combatants often have what they call sympathy breakthroughs. They'll see some a combatant, an adversary, They'll see their eyes, their skin, their face, the sense of their humanity, and it'll be impossible for them to engage in more aggressive tendencies to kill or to shoot or to harm. George Orwell was in a, a little town in Spain. He was fighting the fascists, a necessary in, engagement, but he saw this guy running across this courtyard who was a fascist, had his gun pointed on him, and he said, there's something about this huma the humanity of this person that, that really restricted my aggressive tendencies very common in, in combat for people to un, be unable to harm. What that tells us is in the most extreme adversarial circumstances, we get these rushes of sympathy breakthroughs, our moral emotions, our moral sentiments that are really part of the greater good. Um, I, uh, when I teach this, I really like to kind of embody this. And this has been a really gratifying experience to teach these contemplative practices to 
medical doctors around the country, federal judges, educators, tech people. So just to get a feel for this, um, let's just do a quick contemplation exercise and I'll tell you the science that really that uh, bolsters this practice. What I would like you guys to do is just sit comfortably, um, have a nice erect posture, rest your hands on your knees. Let's take a nice deep breath in, expanding your chest. Relaxing your shoulders and hands as you breathe out. Really a nice deep exhalation, pulling in your abdominal muscles. As you breathe in, think of somebody you really care about, their face, their voice, their bodily presence around you. And as you breathe out, pressing your abdominal muscles in, pushing the air through your nose and mouth. Think of this person and the warmth you feel. And a final breath in, expanding your chest, filling your lungs, appreciating this person you care for. And as you breathe out, follow the air through your mouth and your nose, just appreciating the people you care for. Let's open our eyes. Um, what I find exciting about contemplative design is we're going to learn today about the rich science of compassion, gratitude, and awe. And then alongside that, this design approach to well-being is emerging in many different sectors about taking the ancient traditions that you heard about from Dr. Yuria Salidwin and others about well-being practices, looking at the science, and building them into the context that you work in, be it healthcare, education, or the federal justice system. So our first story is a story of compassion. Uh, and interestingly, uh, in the history and thinking about, uh, in Western European thought about um, human compassion, which is everywhere, if you look at the social scientific data, there was this puzzle that people grappled with about have humans evolved to be kind? Is kindness built into our evolutionary design? At the time of Charles Darwin, a very deeply influential figure in this science, Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of, of the theory of evolution, uh, really felt that sympathy was beyond the logic of evolution, that it was given to us by God. Thomas Huxley, a famous thinker of this era, very popular, a popularizing figure, uh, really felt that compassion, kindness, cooperation, collaboration, et cetera, was not part of our evolutionary history. It was a cultural construction given to us in the form of norms, social contracts, and culture. Charles Darwin really approached this, this space much differently, and this space includes states like compassion, sympathy, where you feel for somebody who's in need, pity, which is compassion imbued with power dynamics, empathy, well studied by Stanford psychologist Jamil Zaki, where you know what others feel, um, and Darwin, felt that compassion was, is really different. And he departed, as I'll get to, he departed from really a, a deep vein of thinking in Western uh, European thought. You don't see this kind of skepticism about compassion in other cultural traditions. Uh, and I'm citing some of the most well-known examples here. Sigmund Freud, uh, very influential, of course, uh, thinker about the human mind said, the fact that we have this commandment, thou shalt not kill, makes it certain we are descended from endlessly long generation of murderers. The idea that we have to tell people not to harm each other tells us it's not part of human nature. Ayn Rand, the great libertarian philosopher, is that if any civilization is to survive, it is the morality of altruism that men have to reject. Machiavelli, who I've studied intensively to write the power paradox of mankind, we may say they're fickle, hypocritical, greedy of gain, etc. As Jamil Zaki has said, and others, there's been a war on compassion for interesting ideological reasons. Darwin didn't see our evolution that way. Darwin, devoted dad, preternaturally kind, really held the members of the Beagle together because of his kindness and connectedness, uh, lived through the deaths of two of his children that changed his thinking about the human psyche where he really felt in his body how powerful our capacity to care is. In particular, watching his young daughter, Annie, whom he was deeply close to, die 
of uh, tuberculosis-like disease. And he said in The Descent of Man, 1871, uh, our sympathy is our strongest instinct and increase through natural selection because those communities with the greatest number of the most sympathetic members will flourish and rear the greatest number of offspring. When I teach human happiness uh, to different audiences like at UC Berkeley and survey what cultures are thriving, I think it's fair to say that the cultures that live the longest, that have the greatest numbers of, of levels of happiness and cooperation and civility and uh, are the most sympathetic as Darwin argued. So Darwin's scholarship now has been updated by in particular Sarah Blaffer Hurdy and other primatologists thinking about human evolution. And their thinking is that the defining feature of human evolution, and I would argue the most significant change in the 6 million years of evolution since we broke off from our primate relatives has to do with this photo, which is these are two infants of the bonobo on your left, the smaller chimpanzee, the chimpanzee on the right, they're babies. And as you can see, these are little babies doing really different things compared to human babies. They are holding food, they're sitting upright, they're sort of on their own in the physical environment. Um, our babies, as most of you probably know by now, are born wildly premature. And we could talk about this in the causes of this. Uh, what that means is our babies, the carriers of our genes, who we have to enable survival uh, for our species to survive, take seven to 55 years to reach the age of viability and independence. They're hyper vulnerable, and that's a game changer in our emotions, our social structures, and the like. So um, moving forward, what that means is we have hyper vulnerable offspring. This is sort of a, a and it led to cooperative child net care networks called allo parenting. And it led to changes in our emotional profile compared to our primate relatives. And it led to what we call a pro-social nervous system, which you'll learn about. Fascinating. Let me just tell you how deep this is in our evolution. Um, mammals, many mammals, uh, the great apes, as pictured here, when offspring die, they will grieve and carry the dead offspring around as we do in our evolutionary history. Their friends will emit these little sounds called coos that signal very have a very specific acoustic structure that signal to the grieving parent, I understand that your loss. So there's early compassion in our great ape relatives in the sounds of vocalization. When we get to humans, this is amplified exponentially. Our vocal apparatus picture here is the most sophisticated structure that produces sound, uh, I believe, in, um, in, the, in the history of life. Uh, when you think about what we can produce as air particles move through our vocal cords, produce sound waves that translate to laughter and music and mother ease and the sounds of emotion, deep universal sounds of human emotion. Um, in our work, and I would encourage you to, for the latest science on this, to go to alancowan.com. We ask people to vocalize the emotions that you're going to hear about today, sympathy and awe. They produce these little quarter second sounds called vocal bursts, like, whoa, or for interest, huh, or for triumph, yeah, right, or sympathy, oh. Really sophisticated sounds that predate language in human evolution, according to the acoustic structures. We play these sounds to people all over the world. And what you can see if you follow my cursor is sympathy is recognized in 10 different cultures, including remote people in Bhutan at above chance levels of accuracy. We have this language of compassion that emerged in our evolution to communicate our kindness towards others. Um, very interestingly, there's a lot of thinking now about the, the kind of the cultural elaboration upon these moral emotions that we'll talk about, how in the Hui Chol tradition, they, in Mexico, they paint these incredible pictures of what awe looks like. Uh, a lot of research has gone into how early human cultural forms like music and chanting and sacred sounds and, and dancing and dramatic forms 
that emerged several hundred thousand years ago took these emotions like compassion and built them into ritualized patterns that we can engage in with other people to build collaborative networks. Uh, really nice statement about this by the anthropologist Isayake. Uh, this is uh, Omane Padme Om that is carved in rocks throughout Bhutan and, and it's a greeting gesture and it in deploys a lot of the sounds by which we convey a, these emotions to each other of om, like awe, and, and has the sounds of compassion, oh, a sound of compassion built into it. So the point here being, we take these early moral emotions, culture builds in symbolic structures to form cultural forms that help us collaborate and be kind, contemplative design in its early form. In making the case as we have for the power of compassion in our evolution. Uh, one of the arguments out in the kind of the game theoretic evolutionary literature, one of the ways in which you build compassionate social networks, those sympathetic communities that Darwin talked about, is if these emotions are highly contagious and spread to people unconsciously. And there's a lot of striking data on this. Uh, and I'll draw your attention to Christakis and Fowler's book, Connected, that shows, and it's interesting to think about the troubles with Facebook now, and they're prioritizing angry content and the troubles online, when in fact humans have this powerful capacity to react to others' signs of sympathy with their own sympathy and, and spread it through social networks. So for example, neonates will show dis distress calls at other neonates' distress calls. A baby will cry and other babies will start crying. Like, there's harm here, let's help these individuals. Christakis and Fowler have remarkable data showing if I move into a part of work that gives a lot to charity, I don't know why, but I start giving a lot to charity. We have data from our lab showing that if I have a tendency to, if I'm around people who are really pro-social physiologically, I will become more pro-social. I can feel it contagiously. And Barbara Ehrenreich has written brilliantly about all the collective rituals, uh, be it the Festival of Guadalupe in Mexico, or Burning Man, or you know the you know the festivals that you might go to uh, at the Day of the Dead or Halloween, bring about this contagious goodwill amongst individuals as a way to spread compassion. Um, I'm going to move on. So let me just end my story on compassion. One of, uh, with it, the question, are we wired to care? Has evolution through the millions of years of our mammalian evolution, breaking off from the primates, the great apes, as, and then 200, 300,000 years of hunter-gatherer evolution, small groups as we've migrated through the world from Africa, has it built into us through shifts in our genetic composition, systems that help us care for others? We've learned a lot, and you probably know about the fight or flight system, but neuroscience is making incredible progress mapping what we've called the pro-social nervous system in a paper, paper from 2014 with a lot of uh, brilliant people like Serena Rodriguez or Serena Saturn um, that involves things like oxytocin, specific regions of the brain, and the vagus nerve, as some of you have probably heard about. So in our lab, at Berkeley, we present people with images that make them immediately feel compassion, like a sibling feeding another sibling in the midst of a famine. Or we'll show them control or comparison slides like the Campanile at Berkeley. And for those of you at Stanford, it may not make you feel too much pride, but for Berkeley undergrads, it does. And what we find, Emiliana Simon Thomas in a paper, just feeling compassion activates the periaqueductal gray. Very interesting, newly neuroanatomically. It's at the base of your spine cord. This is an old region of the brain. It's not new, it's not in your prefrontal cortex. The periaqueductal gray in mammalian research, it, when you stimulate it, it produces nurturant behavior. In humans, it's activated by baby faces, kindness, harm to people you care about. The periaqueductal gray is a region that enables nurturant behavior. And when we feel compassion, it is accompanied by um, 
the, um, the, this activation of the, a very ancient region of the brain involved in caring. Uh, that same kind of experiment showed people slides that make of harm, children who are ill, et cetera, classic images of compassion, activates what's called the vagus nerve. That's this large bundle of nerves that wanders through your, your different organs in your body, projects to your gut, slows your heart rate, helps you vocalize. Here are some facts with this. It's interconnected with oxytocin networks, uh, helps you care for others, and compassion activates the vagus nerve. So for example, at Berkeley, if a student comes in, sees these slides, it makes you feel compassion, or sees slides that makes you feel pride, as you can see in the orange bar, it activates greater vagal activity. Really remarkable. Regions of our nervous system that help us care are activated during feelings of compassion uh, and images of harm. We are wired to care. I believe um, this has as deep an evolutionary story as the fight or flight system, which we've thought so much about. And needless to say, when I teach human happiness, if you have elevated vagal tone activation, um, you, um, you have better health profiles, you are uh, able to handle stress better, compassion is a pathway to health and happiness. What an important science to build a contemplative design around in the world of healthcare. Uh, and this is an illustration of this science. This is a very important paper by Barb Fredrickson at the University of um, North Carolina, random assignment, middle-aged participants. Once a week, they do a loving kindness meditation, which we began our, our story of compassion about. Um, so, you know, and then over the course of eight weeks, they report on their happiness. They measure vagal tone in these participants. And what you can see if once a week I do a loving kindness practice, I show elevated happiness over eight weeks. I also show elevated vagal tone in other findings, elevated connection with others, a sense of creativity. Practicing kindness is one of the most important principles of contemplative design. Cultures have known this for thousands of years uh, and the science is catching up with that wisdom. The second big moral emotion, if you will, is gratitude. I would say that gratitude in the vast science of happiness that we try to represent at the Greater Good Science Center, I feel that gratitude is one of the real success stories, right? Uh, if you want to build in contemplative design into a work unit in a hospital or a group of teachers, or people working in tech, um, one of the things to do is to, pra is to practice gratitude. Uh, gratitude being the feeling of reverence or the sense that things are sacred of things that are given to you, appreciating uh, what's given to you. Um, the cultural history of gratitude is deep. So before I get to that, I'd like to just have us sort of do a little gratitude practice. Again, I believe contemplative design should really draw upon cultural traditions uh, from the indigenous traditions around the world to more recent traditions like Tibetan Buddhism, et cetera, to the contemporary mindful study of this. Um, and um, this is just something that I, I practice with uh, everybody I teach uh, from you know, federal judges to Berkeley undergrads. It's a little mindful practice. It'll take a minute or two. Um, so settle, return to that nice posture of yours, sitting or standing, uh, close your eyes. We're going to return to that very deep, deepened pattern of breathing that we know activates your vagus nerve. Let's kind of take a nice deep breath in, expanding your chest and lungs. As you breathe out, follow the breath through your lungs, your nose, and your mouth. Breathing in, just imagine your attention moving to your feet as your lungs expand, sort of a little body awareness. 
Breathing out, follow your attention to your ankles, your calves and your knees. Breathing in, move your attention to your base of your spinal cord, up to your shoulders, rotate your shoulders. As you breathe out, follow the air through your lungs and mouth and nose, and your attention moves to the top of your head. And now as you breathe in, Let's just take a couple of breaths to think about a moment of gratitude when someone you care about gave you something that matters to you. Breathing in. So you breathe out, following the air through your lungs and nose. Get a sense of what that gift was for your life, how it felt. Deepening this reflection of gratitude as you breathe in, think about what that means to you, that gift from that person. And breathing out, maybe it may be a parent or a friend or a work colleague. Let's open our eyes. Um, Usually I like to take about three to five minutes to do that. This is just a couple of minutes. Um, I'm hoping many of you are kind of practiced in this sort of thing, just taking a couple of minutes of quiet to reflect on kindness or gratitude or we'll get to awe. When I give people a little bit more time on this mindful gratitude, they'll start to think about you know, their mother that gave them a passion in life, her father, a brother, a sister, a friend, somebody at work, I do a lot of this work with Kaiser Permanente, the Permanente Medical Group, and they'll just talk about how much generosity there is in healthcare, right? Because you work so hard, so demanding, and people are stepping up. And then how how critical these acts of gratitude are to healthy social networks, and that in part is a principle of contemplative design to build out connectivity and strong community through these moral emotions. Um, so gratitude has this fascinating uh, history that dates back to the great economist, Adam Smith, who really felt it was the social glue of economic culture. Robert Trivers, the great uh, environmental of, uh, it, 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 uh, evolutionary scientist said that gratitude is the foundation of altruistic societies. Paul Woodruff, I'd really recommend you read his book on reverence tracing back gratitude to Confucianism and reverence and its, its fundamental element, presence in, in East Asian society, in Greek society. And of course, people like Dr. Yuria Salidwin have traced reverence and gratitude back to uh, what she calls uh, an ethics of belonging, right? That we have gratitude for nature and all that it can give us uh, deep in all the rich indigenous traditions that are part of uh, our evolution. Um, it has a very proximal evolutionary story, like all of the emotions I study. This is a phenomenal observation by Franz Duval, the great primatologist, who observed, as you see in these photos, uh, that chimpanzees, if they share food with a fellow chimpanzee, the recipient of that gift, as you see in the photos, will kind of groom the food giver, right? Like this chimpanzee on the left will start grooming uh, another chimpanzee if that chimpanzee is given the individual food. Food is so fundamental in that primate society, of course it's fundamental to our survival, that you will groom and give the pleasures of touch and expressing your gratitude through, to, through tactile contact if you've been given food. It's the foundation of those social networks. Uh, if you think back in our evolutionary history, food sharing was fundamental. It was a fundamental adaptation to survival, necessary to survival. And what you find in anthropological analysis is that sort of food sharing and the rituals around food sharing become a fundamental structure to healthy society. So that the Netsilik in Canada and indigenous peoples live off of seals. When you were born into that society, 
Um, you, ha you have 12 food sharing partners. They have diagrams of what parts of the seal you are to share with other people in this tight social network uh, of food sharing. Um, and then if you study the great celebrations and, and, uh, uh, that are centered upon food sharing, the potlatches and others, what you find is people will devote periods of time to growing yams or to gathering food. They share them in these celebrations and the fundamental emotion that is expressed during these uh, celebrations is gratitude. You show your gratitude for the people who share. Now, putting these observations together, my lab got really interested in touch as a way that we express gratitude. You may have heard of this study. Um, and this is really the brilliant work of Matt Hertenstein, uh, one of the world's leading scholars of touch now. Um, when you think about our social lives and how we express our gratitude and a lot of other states as well, and a lot of problematic emotions like inappropriate sexual interest at work, it's through touch. Touch is this incredible language uh, by which we communicate to others. A Nobel Prize in physiology was just given to uh, a scientist at UC San Francisco who's figuring out how touch influences very sophisticated cells in your skin uh, to communicate uh, these kinds of things. So in our paradigm, participants come to the lab. They, one participant shows up a little early. They're, they're positioned on one side of a barrier. They stick their arm through a barrier. Another person comes in and is asked to touch that arm uh, through different, whatever they want to do to communicate emotions like compassion and gratitude and love and anger, fear and disgust. Uh, the person who's been touched guesses what emotion happens. One out of six is chance guessing, uh, which is very low. And what you see is you can identify very readily emotions expressed through touch like gratitude, which is expressed with a little clasp or shake to the arm, compassion and love, and negative emotions as well. Touch is a medium of gratitude, as is many other mediums. There's a lot of work on the benefits of expressing gratitude. Sarah Aljo, former student in my lab, expressing gratitude as you join a social group, you develop stronger social networks as part of that group. Adam Grant, the great um, uh, kind of organizational psychologist at Warden, managers trying to get people to, to do some work. If they express thank, if they just say thank you to a participant, that person much more likely to help a stranger. Gratitude, Amy Gordon from our lab now at Michigan. If you are with your romantic partner and you just casually say thank you from time to time and express appreciation, it holds the relationship together. So much work on gratitude about its power as a social glue uh, and important to our contemplative design. One of the things I like to do in thinking about contemplative design when I work with different groups, you know, you have a group of 25 people. I was with, for example, at, with uh, leaders at Kaiser Permanente, all women. It was a, a program focused on women leadership at Kaiser Permanente, doing much more serious work than I would ever do, big budgets, lives on the line. And I just had them start to tell stories of gratitude about their colleagues at work in the high pressured work that they do. And suddenly um, these stories started to roll out about people in the room, how grateful they were for things they had done. And, and you just could feel the fabric of, of connectivity that gratitude creates and goodwill just by taking a few moments to express gratitude uh, in the form of these three good things. This is one of the kind of real success stories in positive psychology or the science of happiness. Um, I'm drawing your attention here in the figure, a really nice work by so Sonia Libermersky and her colleagues. One of the most, uh, one of their earlier kind of experimental studies of gratitude, middle-aged people randomly assigned. They either take 30 minutes to write what they're grateful for or they take 30 minutes to write about a control condition, a control theme, which is in the blue. And what you can see, if you follow how happy the people are, uh, just a week after or immediately after, and one month after writing for 30 minutes about what you're grateful for, you see boosts in well being uh, just by taking 30 minutes at one day to, to think about what you're grateful for. 
right? And practicing gratitude um, in this secular kind of ecumenical way is, is one of the most potent ways to lift well-being, reduce inflammation in your body, to lower cortisol levels, uh, to increase, um, you know, performance at work. And this is nicely reviewed, and I'm presenting some highlights here by Robert Emmons, 2007. And at greatergood.berkeley.edu, we have a lot of, kind of we keep up to date on this literature of how powerful this practice is. It reduces blood pressure. Mills at UC San Diego, uh, people with heart failure have better health profiles uh, if they practice a little gratitude, including reduced inflammation. Better um, trauma profiles, Todd Cashton has found. Uh, and then lots of interesting neuroscientific work by Cairns up at the University of Oregon. Really strong to cultivate this sense of gratitude. Okay. That's story number two, compassion, gratitude. And now is the third one on awe um, and um, that I've been obsessed with uh, in my lab for the past 10 years and have a book coming out on this in the spring from Penguin entitled Awe, um, I hope. Um, and what a, an incredible emotion to think about with respect to contemplative design. Uh, and in fact, um, as, as I'll hint at, you know, when you think about uh, the great temples, the great cathedrals, the great buildings, uh, the streets of a, uh, you know, a Mayan sacred site or the streets of Paris, they've been designed according to principles of all. So this should be something that is front and center at contemplative design. It is, in some sense, the ultimate aesthetic emotion um, and um, so important. Um, I define it as the feeling of being in the presence of vast mysteries that transcend your understanding of the world. So awe is about big, powerful things and vastness and mystery. You don't know what you're, you can't immediately categorize what you're confronting. Um, in uh, some awe facts for you guys, just to orient us to this important emotion. The etymological origin of awe goes back to Middle English ege and Old Norse agi from the ninth, eighth and ninth, cent ninth centuries, 1100 years ago. And at that time, uh, those words that eventually led to the construction of the word awe um, refer to fear and dread and terror. So awe is really closely connected to fear. Um, but cultures change and by implication, emotions change. And we live in a much different world than what the world was like in eighth and ninth century in Europe. Uh, and the historians like, uh, and scientists like Steve Pinker reveal that the dark ages and even the Renaissance that followed were some of the most violent, brutal times in human history of shortened lives, torture, brutality, children dying young. Uh, we live in a different era, right? And awe is really different and, and not as closely allied with fear and dread as the words would connote. Our data from around the world, we ask people each day to kind of report on whether they felt awe and people feel, about, feel awe about two and a half times a week. So that suggests that awe is um, pretty common, which is striking. Um, just to give you a sense of what we've published in no, a number of papers uh, and other labs have around the world, about three quarters of awe experiences are fundamentally positive. They feel good, you like them, even though it's mysterious, you wanna explore. Uh, really cool scientific work from Japan showing that awe is rooted in the reward circuitry in the brain. Our lab has found and other labs that awe is, engages vagal tone, the vagus nerve. So it's really about openness, exploration and curiosity. We've done a lot of experimental work, getting people to feel awe in the moment through slides, film clips. We've studied people 
in looking out at vast vistas and in near Yosemite and you know, in near the, the Great Wall of China. Other people have studied people at musical concerts and at festivals. There's a really cool awe science that's happening. And in general, what happens is when you feel awe through any of these means, you, you are less focused on yourself, you're more humble, you're less stressed, you're happier, you feel like you have more time. We've published data showing you're more open-minded and rigorous in your thinking. You have less inflammation in your immune system. It is very good news for your body and your mind. I, I actually, I, I don't think there's a single thing you can do for 10 or 15 minutes that's better for your mind and body than finding some awe. What important scientific knowledge to have when we think about contemplative design. Um, and about a quarter of those experiences of awe are really threat-based in fear and dread and so forth. So let me tell you an incredible uh, cultural history of awe. And in many ways, culture archives awe. Culture is a way in which we represent this fundamental emotion to human survival um, that I'll, I'll make the case for in our next and our last 10 to 15 minutes. Um, I'm not sure Dr. Yuri Salidwen talked about this, but you know, in reading her writings, obviously awe is, is at the heart of what, what is now being called traditional ecological knowledge or what she calls indigenous contemplative science. Indigenous cultures for 10, 20,000 years have been cultivating awe through a relationship to the, to the local environment, knowledge about plants, ethnobotany, forms of art, practicing rituals, architectural design. Uh, that the, on the right there is the is uh, Weechal string painting. And a lot of the traditional art of Mesoamerica was about allowing people to drop into the experience of awe through visual art. Um, what we find uh, is that awe is, is a deep part of the written traditions, right? Uh, the mystical traditions of encounters with the divine. Bhagavad Gita in the story of Arjun encountering, seeing the cosmos through God's eye. One of the first books uh, in the English language written by a woman because of course they were prevented from doing so was Julian of Norwich's uh, Divine Revelations where she wrote about encountering the love of Christ. Uh, and it was all about her experiences of mystical awe. St. Francis of Assisi, a very important mystic, uh, wrote about those quite extensively. And then what happens, and we are really a product of this revolution, is the age of enlightenment in Western Europe uh, really, and in particular, Edmund Burke secularizes awe. He says, you can feel awe, the wonders of vast mysteries, almost anywhere. And in Burke's writing, who's, you know, he's this interesting revolutionary thinker, you know, you can feel awe in nature and in skies and in light and shadows and animals and so forth, as long as you, what you're encountering is powerful, vast, and obscure. Um, in response to Burke, you get probably the people you've heard about that very much influence the kind of the Western, the American study of awe is romanticism of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, turn of the century, Goethe, and then the great scientist von Humboldt who felt like we can find awe in music and art and above all nature um, and our relationship to nature. And that really shaped Ralph Waldo Emerson who has had a profound influence um, on kind of our view of awe today in, you know, not only the United States, but many Western European cultures um, that you can find awe in the everyday and in particular in our relationship to nature. So when we think about building awe in a contemplative design, uh, here are some findings for us to think about. We have studied um, uh, awe in 30 countries. Uh, and what we did is we um, asked people 
systematically, I list here 26 countries, it's really 30 now, uh, nice samples of people. We said, awe, we would like you to tell us a story about awe. And by awe, we mean when you encounter things that are vast, that are you don't understand, they're mysterious. And then people, instead of telling them what to rate, in this methodology, they get to write about what made them feel all. And these are people in Brazil and Mexico and Canada and parts of Africa and India and China and Japan and South Korea and Norway and Germany and Poland and Italy and Spain, all over the world. Um, they write about their experiences of awe. And we gather these narratives. It took us uh, 20 speakers of 20 different languages at UC Berkeley to translate them. We spent a lot of time coding them into what you might think of as a taxonomy of what I'll call the eight wonders of everyday life. And this is what's fascinating to me. It's just descriptive, no real hypothesis here. People feel awe about the goodness of other people. And you think about Facebook, you know, approaching contemplative design, prioritizing what makes you outraged and angry, when in fact, people have this deep predilection to be moved by the kindness, courage of other people. People feel awe about nature, collective effervescence. That's, I'll get to that in a second, dancing and festivals and rituals in church and so forth, visual art, music, big ideas. I had a Japanese student who went to a natural history museum and this made me happy because I found awe in natural history museums when I was a kid. And he's like, my God, I can't, he just suddenly grasped when he was about 10 years old, evolution, that we are this species that evolved from all these other species. And he's like, my goodness, you know, what a big idea that life is always evolving, mystical experiences, and then life and death. Eight wonders that regularly around the world produce awe. So let me dig deep into a couple of these and then we'll, we'll close. Again, the most common source of awe, 40 to 50% of the time around the world is other people or what John Haidt called and Thomas Jefferson uh, and uh, others, uh, the, the kindness, courage, he, they call them ele elevation. It's when we're overwhelmed by the kindness, courage, and uh, strength of other people. Um, like Ella Baker, who was a civil rights activist, pictured there when I read her, her biography of how she was just a, a glue of the civil rights movement, risking her life, sort of bringing communities together around the South. Or, you know, for the many people, Mahatma Gandhi, who led a nonviolent protest that overthrew colonialism. Um, uh, and, you know, is striking a uh, form of courage and kindness. We are wired to be inspired by the kindness and courage of others. Um, it's so interesting as an exercise, I do this with my Berkeley undergrads, just to take a moment to reflect in the spirit of contemplation Who's somebody who gives you that feeling of awe, may give you a little rush of goosebumps um, when you think about their courage or kindness. Um, I had the great privilege of, of working uh, in San Quentin prison in restorative justice and just thinking about the people there inside prisoners trying to build peace in our toughest institution um, really incredible just to cultivate the sense of the goodness of other people. Um, like Stephen Sifra, who got out of prison and started Underground Scholars at UC Berkeley, which now consults and advises people coming out of prison to go it, get into community colleges, state colleges, state universities in the UC um, when they had no idea that that was possible, right? How you could come up with that kind of vision in those moments. Um, this gives you a feel of the stories we gathered from around the world. Here's a woman I think who was from uh, Ireland. I was watching my daughter perform, who was born with bilateral club, club foot. So her feet were uh, uh, problematic. And I watched her dance in a recital for the first time. I was filled with awe 
I was backstage with her getting ready for the performance. When I watched her get ready for the performance, even though she had these formerly crippled feet, now she was getting ready to dance in ballet. I felt the beginning of tears and my heart felt like it was going to explode. This other one is a really cool one. A son, 1973, his dad runs this bar and uh, a bar, a, a client there, uh, the son shows up with an African-American and the client uses the N-word to the bartender, the dad, and the dad says, you got to get out of this bar. You cannot use that word uh, in 1973. So um, my apologies about uh, the shifting focus of this. You know what we know when you are exposed to these stories of people who make you all feel awe because of their courage and kindness, you get the chills, you tear up, you have elevated vagal tone, elevated oxytocin, parts of your brain, the orbital frontal cortex that are involved in ethical decision-making light up, and just being exposed to morally inspiring uh, stories makes people more willing to share, cooperate, uh, be, wanna be better, work harder, be more inspired. Again, you know, this is viral. Jonah Berger at Wharton, has done brilliant work, former Stanford PhD. Jonas found, if I, if I, the thing I wanna share online is this, these stories of goodness and they're viral and we share them with others. And again, imagine how we could build this principle of the contagious power of elevation or, or the awe we feel at others' moral beauty uh, if we built it into contemplative design. Second wonder, this should be obvious to you guys, is nature. Um, perhaps Dr. Urias Salidwin talked about um, how deep this principle is in indigenous traditions, tens of thousands of years old. They had rich knowledge bases that they passed on from one another uh, over the course of intergenerational knowledge transmission. Uh, Pierre Roti has written a nice review of how uh, this is really about seeing the world as being interconnected, seeing how eco the species are collaborating with each other. And we're now learning both in evolutionary thinking and the new science of trees and fungi, how true this is, um, how plants and animals are, are animated by vital forces. Uh, it is very deep in our experience of awe to learn this about the natural world. Here are a couple of stories I love this story from our work from Russia. Uh, five years ago, I was collecting mushrooms in the forest and I bumped into an uncommon hole in the ground and around it, all the, the trees stood as if in a circle, as if gazing into a hole. Very common in experiences of natural awe. Our second wonder are these feelings that other species have consciousness like plants and trees and fungi and a lot of the work as is written about by people like michael pollan have said maybe that's true They're, they show forms of intentionality this idea that through natural awe we learn fundamental truths about reality was at the heart of ralph waldo emerson's american transcendentalism i've given you some examples here he really felt that the deepest operations of the mind come out of experiences of awe in nature. Ideas like, uh, you know, if I watch clouds, I get a sense of impermanence, that things change. That if I study other species, I discover design in the symmetry and fractal patterns in natural forms, deep insights through nature. So in my lab, we've done a lot of different studies of this. There's a uh, kind of a well-known one by Paul Piff. Take students on the Berkeley campus, they look into these trees for a minute, or they're standing in the same place and they look into a building. And what we find is a little moment of awe makes students feel less self-important in the green, less entitled. They didn't need as much money to do the study. And they actually helped a stranger who dropped some pens as part of the experiment by them. They became more altruistic ton of studies like this showing awe leads to not only goodwill towards others, Christoph Green and I have an essay at Greater Good showing, and Francis Quo, former Berkeley student, has, is really the leader in this work, 
that really getting outdoors is very good for the body uh, as studied for decades and centuries in the forest bathing practices of Japan and South Korea uh, and good for the mind. Um, mindful of time and I'm gonna close out in four minutes. Actually what I wanna do, there's really neat work on collective effervescence, dancing and so forth. Uh, we've done work getting underprivileged teenagers and veterans to go out rafting together and find that they have less stress as teenagers, more happiness, and veterans have a 30% drop in PTSD. Um, but I'll close on something that some of you may be asking about. It's very fitting, you know, for a Berkeley professor speaking at Stanford to talk about uh, psychedelics and mysticism. A lot of this work uh, began in some sense uh, in the Bay Area at Berkeley and Stanford and Esalen and other places. Uh, and I just want to alert you to, uh, you know, this interesting embracing of spirituality that awe engages us in. William James, the great psychologist, wrote about this, this feeling of mystical awe, where we encounter what we consider to be divine. As Dr. Uriah Salidwin has written, you know, just sort of this, it's this mystical state that's cultivated through rituals and engagement with nature. Um, and we, uh, if I could just go to the next slide, um, one of the really interesting movements now in well-being science is the study of psychedelics as, as really popularized by Michael Pollan uh, up at Berkeley and elsewhere. And, you know, this experience brought about by plant medicines that really are sort of central to many indigenous cultures who built up this rich knowledge around psilocybin in Mesoamerica and ayahuasca and peyote, et cetera. Uh, really central to Native American traditions. Millions of Americans have tried this. And I know many of you have probably been tracking this literature, but Roland Griffiths, Robin Carhart Harris, uh, Peter Hendricks is really important to read here, have found that this is very good news for a lot of well-being. It's a form of contemplation. In indigenous traditions, it's just a small part of a broader contemplative design and orientation to the world of finding awe, of finding the marvels of nature and people and cultural engagement. And in the, the new science of psychedelics, it helps people, uh, most people will feel that this is one of the most deep awe experiences of their lives. Uh, most people find pretty enduring well-being benefits and shifts in their orientation to the world. And then it helps with addiction and depression, uh, terminal disease and the anxiety around it and PTSD. And Peter Hendricks is underappreciated here and David Yaden now at Johns Hopkins because they're both making the case this transformation is about all, is about this burst of all that people get through these plant medicines. So with that, I'll close and I'll just say, stay tuned for uh, an awe book, but more importantly, um, go to the Greater Good Science Center, greatergood.berkeley.edu, where we have a ton of free resources, uh, all about compassion, gratitude, awe, and then things like mindfulness, um, connectivity, handling stress, et cetera, for, that are free, that are for all of you to think about contemplative design and the greater good. Thank you. Wow, thank you for that amazing journey through so much knowledge and wisdom and for all the contributions you've made to this body of literature. I think we'll begin with the question that came in after you talked about awe is the ultimate aesthetic emotion. And the question asks about the built environment and how uh, or whether your work has included work with city planners and architects so that uh, the spaces that we are in, if we're not out in a forest, uh, are also potentially offering us all. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm so grateful for that question because when I saw 
that, you know, this conference, I was like, this is what we need to be doing together, right? Which is all gives us some principles, as does the study of beauty. And aesthetic beauty is different from all, as Edmund Burke and Immanuel Kant and our lab has shown. Um, and, and awe is about vastness, is about yourself relating to patterns that are part of the vastness. Uh, it's about a sense of humility, uh, it's contrast and so forth. Um, and there are ready principles of awe that you can apply to aesthetic design of hospital spaces, which need it. Uh, certainly museum, uh, museums are very interested in this. Uh, and I've done some work with museums. And schools, I think, you know, increasingly, when you think about, you know, this is one of the heartbreaks. We, when we did the study of taking under-resourced kids out rafting, their school looked like a prison and schools should not look like prisons. They should have, and Francis Quo's done great work on like, when poor neighborhoods get green spaces and trees and grassy lawns, there's less crime, there's more civility. The recent study of Portland and all the deaths that were brought about by the um, heat wave were brought about because there were no greens. There, was no, there were no trees or plants or green spaces in those regions of the city that killed people. This is a major opportunity to fight climate change is to think about awe-based design for schools, cities, et cetera. And there's a lot of activity around this that we learn from. So yes, there's good work to be done from this. And on your website, is there a section that addresses this area of work? Yeah, we've, um, there, you know, we've been, I'm not, I can't remember because the website is 20 years of curated material. Uh, there's a group in London. London has some of the, the richest green spaces of any city in the world mm -hmm. and, it, and its commitment to that. And now other cities are following suit. Um, and they, there are urban designers who have been designing spaces in London to cultivate well-being and all, right? To give people a little dose of, of green space. So I would start there um, and, and then see where it takes you. And, and, and it's an opportunity for, for many people for out there. That wonderful and, and promising response to that first question. The next question, do we see compassion and gratitude in non-primates? The individual writes, I'm thinking about watching the crows alloprene on the wire outside my window right now. Do other animals show gratitude? Well, you know, this is the work of Jane Goodall um, and, and Charles Darwin, who felt that Darwin was radical because he said, our best sentiments like kindness, gratitude, and awe, you can see in other species, right? And then Franz Duval, the reason I, I cite that food sharing study of his is he's showing that non-chimpanzees will show gratitude in the form of grooming when they've, been when they've been given a gift of food. So that's demonstration of it. And now, it, you know, the observation of crows showing it or blackbirds, uh, the idea that you're trading some form of reverence for a gift as being the core to gratitude, um, I'll bet we're gonna see it in a lot of, of other species, right? My former postdoc, uh, Yoel Inbal Bartal Benami, Inbal Bartal Benami has shown that rats show empathy and compassion. So now we just need the paradigms to show that they're sharing and they're showing gratitude like Franz Duval encouraged us to think about it. And I would encourage people to go to Franz Duval as sort of the beginnings of that thinking. Thank you. The next question uh, asks about the attention economy and your references to Facebook's posts that uh, yeah. build up fear. And the question asks for you to speak to the impact on the environment of the attention economy and whether the fear that is trying to monetize people's engagement with social media is contributing to the disconnection from nature. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, this is the big question of our times. Um, you know, what is this attention economy doing to these moral sentiments? Um, and that, you know, I've talked about compassion, gratitude, and awe as our better tendencies. And if you stick close to them, we'll do okay. We won't use res natural resources, you know, 
we would have a different relationship to the natural world, to people who are different from our tribe, et cetera. Um, and I think that the, uh, you know, the story is going to be complicated. Um, Black Lives Matter um, started with a video of Darnella Frazier, I think, from uh, Minneapolis. It started prior to that, but it was through Facebook. And that's one of the most important movements we've had in um, the, you know, the last five, 10 years and beyond. So there's a lot of good that comes out of it, a lot of art sharing, music sharing. But I'm very worried about, I, I think Facebook's really in, uh, worth singling out because of these intentional manipulations of our emotions and moving us away from what Jonah Berger has shown. Like we love sharing good stories about people. Um, they are viral and Facebook moved away from that principle of contemplative design. We love showing examples of kindness. Uh, people moved away from that. And so the, the question is, what does it do to our experience of the natural world is untested and, and I think open. I am very worried. I would put money on the idea that it deep engagement in these uh, uh, certain platforms diminish compassion, which is problematic. So um, that's worrisome. And we need the science to show that. Uh, and we need the Surgeon General to make a statement. <laughs> once the science is in. Well, thank you for being a person we can count on who will contribute yeah. to this historic time and the right choices for the yeah. choices. Yeah. To some other questions, uh, an individual asks, you mentioned the inability to immediately characterize information when experiencing all. Have you or others conducted cognitive psychological research on all? Yeah, you know, I, uh, it's, it's stunning to me. Um, here's, um, there is only one or two peer reviewed papers on children and all. And it's my belief that we've taken all out of early education and we need to return it to allow our kids to wonder and wander and embrace mystery. If you're teaching to tests, you don't get to head into mystery, right? Um, cognitive science uh, is getting interested in it. Um, and I think that there are a couple of findings that are really noteworthy here. One is we published a paper with Tanya Lombroso, who's now at um, Princeton, who found that the more you cultivate awe, the better at scientific reasoning you are. You tend to see broad patterns of causal forces that are part of the scientific inquiry, right? Like, wow, there's an ecosystem here. There, there are patterns of weather or weather systems. So that's really interesting. You see things in terms of deep systems and interlocking causal forces. And then um, Pierre Carlo Valdesolo has shown, shown and others that we see you're, you're, you can think about analytical cognition that narrows in, reduces things to parts and sort of relationships, linear cause, cause effect linear relationships, all kinds of opens you up to this sensitivity to patterns in the world of complicated forces that shape a person's life or shape the, the economy, right? So I think, I think our world needs the patterns of thought that awe brings us, especially in our younger generation, right? They're hyper analytical um, and, and, and this is co great contemplative design, not only is reductionistic and analytic, but it's also synthetic and holistic. And we need both and awe is a pathway to the, the second one. Building on that insight, there's a question about the reductionistic univariate approach for rigorous science. And you mentioned the phenomenon that all helps to introduce people to the complexity. Could you speak more to how an individual's capacity to sustain their engagement with complexity is built so that if it's a psilocybin experience or a deep meditation experience yeah. that gives a little yeah. breakthrough insight 
how is the architecture for sustained capacity cultivated? What a, what a what, man, that question's like a couple of careers of, you know, and, and teams thinking about it. So one of the things I love about all, by the way, for new scientific approaches that are beyond univariate, I encourage everybody to go visit alancowan.com. He's my brilliant computational collaborator. And all of this movement toward data-driven computational science is moving away, not only from univariate, but simplistic multivariate approaches. And he's the best and he's done it with emotion and it's and music and visual art. It's amazing. AlanCowan.com. Um, I think one of the most important things for all of us is complexity, is awe allows you to say, part of my mind loves to just reduce things to simple cause effect relationships, but wow, once we expand our spatial understanding of causal forces, our temporal understanding, there's all this causal complexity. And that's, that's got to be the gateway to 21st century solutions, right? To climate change, to redesigning hospitals, um, to how we use big data, how Facebook might use big data to help the world instead of get us to do ads. Um, and, and so how do we embrace it? I think your, your, uh, our, our friend out in the audience, Contemplation does that. Um, psychedelics do it because you're humbled by the experience. Pathways to humility, immersion in nature does it, where you're like, God, I can't, I, you know, I was backpacking with my daughter, Natalie. I was like, I can't believe the Sierras. I just couldn't, my mind couldn't figure it out. And I was, I came out of it thinking about complexity and, and that has to be a charge. Uh, and not, and not to make it just the like, whoa, isn't the world mysterious? That's it. But to, to treat it as a, an intellectual discipline of like, this is how we, systematically go after complexity, which we can with the new tools of computational statistics. And so I, I love the question because we can do it in our everyday lives through meditation, awe, nature, music. A lot of people who love music, the great musicians, you know, it, it, for those of you who are out there who really, they're like, I've played the cello for 40 years and I still can't believe Yo-Yo Ma. I can't believe it. Out of what you know that's what we need more of mm -hmm. what a wonderful response thank you we'll have one final question and that is dearest dacker thank you this has been fantastic as your insights always are one question you mentioned compassion gratitude and all as the foundational emotions to altruistic societies indigenous people base well-being on these practices as how to relate to the earth how can Western science dialogue more with indigenous science to shift the human presence in the earth to one of reverence coming from all compassion and gratitude instead of the current ownership and extractivism without falling into domination and appropriation as is the tendency in colonial societies? Well, you know, I'm what a deep question and, and that's really, you know, that's what I, that's the next frontier is to, we've been talking about a more complicated science of systems that indigenous peoples have been doing for decades. And so, you know, how do we do this? We reconceptualize well being. Everybody's interested in well being, but, but it's largely been about self. Now it's gotten to like community, and now it has to extend to the environment. And the data are in. You are, you are happier if the environment around you is happier. It's self evident. So we've got to extend this consideration. We have to bring, you know, I'm in the contemplative world and, and it thought it, it just does, it hasn't thought about indigenous traditions of the 500 million people around for tens of thousands of years faced incredible trauma. And yet they have these rich indigenous traditions and you read them and you're like, whoa, this is like Charles Darwin's thinking about our evolution. It's the same thing, right? So we got to bring that into scholarship and then it's just got to, you know, it's got to extend through uh, the, the, act, the, act, the practical, actionable work we do like this conference in, in a hospital or in a school or in an educational curriculum or at a retreat or, you know, in the law <laughs> or in prisons. Uh, it, we, it, there's a, 
great synthesis. And I keep citing Dr. Yuria Salibrin because she sees it and I think it's coming and I, I can't wait to see what it brings us. Mm -hmm. And I'll just offer for those who did not hear Dr. Yuris Leadwin's talk, it will be posted on the contemplation.stanford.edu site after the conclusion of this summit. Dacker, we wish you all and we offer <laughs> you our gratitude for your compassion and all you do to serve the greater good. Thank you for your talk today and for being with us. It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.